that I want you to see how important you how, how important you are. You are a child of God. You're a child of God. You are you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Right? You need to understand who you are. If you remember, now it's been a couple of weeks now. Okay, we were in First Chronicles. We're going verse by verse through. It's actually, it's actually more in, intense than that. We are going verse by verse through the Old Testament, but we're doing this in chronological order, which makes us jump around quite a bit in this section because it's David's life. We're actually towards the end of David's life. And David wrote a lot of Psalms during this time. When we get to Solomon, the next, the next hero of the faith, Solomon, the big knucklehead, uh, then we have Song of Solomon, we have the Proverbs and all that we'll be mixing in with the story. If you need a Bible, raise your hand, we'll get you a Bible. And here we are. And again, uh, uh, chapter 21, we've already covered. I'm just going to remind you of this, and then we'll, we'll jump into a little bit more detail of this. Father, we love you and praise you, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness and your love, Lord. Thank you for your word that just enriches our souls. Remind us of your faithfulness, Lord, and your love. And Lord, just thank you, Lord, that you told us, Lord, that we can come boldly into your throne room and we do that, even now, Lord, to tell you that we love you, we praise you, Lord. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your deep patience with us. And Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, open your word to us. Help me to stay out of the way. Help us to hear your voice tonight. We love you a lot in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen and amen. All right. Well, this chapter 21, if you remember now, it is we are towards the end of David's life. King David, a man after God's own heart, did some great things and was a complete loser on some things. And uh, boy, boy, he can say that about all of us, huh? Oh, wow. But uh, here you have at the end of his life, he's not going to, he's going to finish so-so. This is not one of his great moments here, is this. And it, it, we can say, well, it's not his fault. It really is. It says that then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. So you can say, well, you know, it was Satan's fault that did this. And we talked about Satan. If you remember last time, that was the last time we were together. We kind of talked about who Satan is, where he came from and all that and how to defeat him according to the word of God. But, but here you don't have to listen to the devil. You don't have to listen to him. He's going to tell, he's going to, here's what he's going to do. He's going to lie to me about you and lie to you about me. He's going to lie. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. And that's what he's going to do. David didn't need to listen to him, but he did, and it got him in big trouble. Well, notice what it says here. Joab, his commander of the army, he told him, he said, go number the people of all the way from Beersheba to Dan, all the way to the country. Go get them all and get a, get a report that I may know the number. For military purpose, for tax purposes, to understand how big his army was and all that. And Joab said, no, may the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are. Uh, they are. Are they not my Lord, the King? All of them are my Lord's servants. Why then should my Lord inquire like this? What are you doing? Why should it be a cause of guilt for Israel? But the King's word prevailed. What are you doing? He should have listened to his friend, his advisor right here. Look, don't do this. Don't do this. What are you doing? You know that God doesn't want you to number. If, if, you're, if God wants you to number people, he'll tell you to do that. But he told you don't do that. Because your numbers, it wasn't to be in your own strength and might. It was in his strength and might. But he does it anyways. Well, and it kind of gives, you know, a million people, a million warriors, a million people ready to battle. So he knows he has a big army. But in the background of this thing, even while he's, he's they haven't finished the count yet, there starts to become a, a, a rumbling there starts to become a moment. In fact, they don't, we learn this later on, they don't finish the count because God is already starting to come down on them. You're not supposed to do this. You reap what you sow. You're not supposed to do this. So in this relationship that he had with David, he told David, he said, here's the deal. He says, you're going to choose one of these. We get down to verse 12. Either Either three years of famine or three months of devastation by your foes while your sword of your enemies overtake you, or else three days of, of the sword of the Lord, pestilence on the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. He said, you got to pick one. Either, either three years of famine, three months on the run, or three, day, three days of pestilence. you got to pick one. Boy, that's hard to do. You did this. Oh, hold on now, you're jumping ahead of that. Nancy over there. So 
she's sneaking ahead and read ahead. Okay, so, 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 but here's the thing. Now, when David is, is saying, he says, don't make me do that. That's exactly what we'd say. Don't make me do that. But notice this. He says, but don't let me fall into the hands of men. Don't, in other words, don't do this. Don't make me choose which one of these punishments to have. It's my fault, but don't let me, that number two, don't do that one. Don't let me run away from my enemies. That was, and just think about David's life. That's his whole life. He was running from his son, running from Saul. I mean, he, he knew a lot about running away from his enemies. He says, that's the one I don't want. He says, but I'm going to leave this into your hands. And what happens is in verse 14, so the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel and 70,000 men of Israel fell. Heavy, 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 heavy. You know, and again, we already talked about it. We already kind of reasoned through some of this stuff. This one's a hard one. Sin has consequences. Sin has consequences. When you go out and sin, you hurt, you hurt people. We, we see that with kids, especially if you got a family and you got, you got somebody in the family that's, that's messing up and that hurts the kids. And, and uh, it just, sin hurts people. It hurts the church. When you got a pastor that's that's going in a, in a bad direction, having affairs or something. And, uh, and when that happens, it destroys the church. You know, it can destroy a lot of people. Keep your, keep your pastor accountable and be praying for him. He's a weirdo, okay? <laughs> Don't amen that. But you know what? The higher visibility, the higher what? You know this? The higher accountability. And so here, here because of his sin, this is pretty heavy right here. I've done some bad things, but I didn't have 70,000 people die because I got stupid, Here's 70,000 people died. Well, David's like having this moment, as he should, this destroying angel going through. He said to the angel who was working destruction, it's enough. How, uh, now stay your hand, and the angel of the Lord stayed his hand uh, by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. That's important right there. This is important geography right there. Right. So what, is, what does he do? And again, we've already covered this last time. He builds an altar on this threshing floor. On this threshing floor, okay, do you know what a threshing floor is? It's a, it's a place on a mountain, usually not on the top generally. Generally, it's down a little bit low. It's where the wind, where you're going to have wind coming through there. And it's a flat spot. It's where you're going to thresh out the wheat. This is important for understanding many things in the Bible. But he talks about the wheat and the chaff, the threshing floor, all of that. Well, this is a, this is a big uh, flat area where you take the wheat, Put it there, and then there's, there's several ways to do it. Uh, most of the time, they'll put like a heavy board on it, something heavy on it. And the kids actually can, can have fun with this as well because they'll, they'll stand on the board and they'll drag it around. Many times it's got rocks that are attached to the bottom of it. And they're, what they're trying to do is separate the wheat. The wheat is on the ground and the stalks, and they're going over it with this heavy board trying to, to separate it. Then they're going to take the, the stalks away. And now you just got the weed and the chaff. That's what you got. That's been broken away. And they'll take, they'll take a shovel and you can go online and watch this and they'll throw it up in the air. And if it's got to have a good wind and the wind will blow the chaff, the lighter away, and they'll, you'll, you'll end up with a, a pile of chaff and a pile of weed. He'll separate the weed and the chaff is a, one of the stories that Jesus told. And so this threshing floor is important. It's important geography, this threshing floor of Aruna, because it will be, it's on the top of Mount Moriah. It will be the place where David builds an altar, according to the Jewish tradition, the same place where Abraham built an altar and sacrificed his son Isaac. This is, this is and I want to spend some time with you, maybe next time. This, this is sacred ground right here. This, this threshing floor of Aruna, this, this, this threshing floor will become the place for the temple, okay, it'll become Solomon's temple to be destroyed. Then it'll be Herod's, what's known as uh, Ezra and Nehemiah will rebuilt it, and then Herod's called Herod's temple because he's going to refurbish it. It is, it is holy ground today. There's something special about that place. There's something special about sacred spaces. Now, if you're not familiar with that concept, it's a powerful concept. The Bible speaks about sacred spaces. Right? And this is one of them. This is one of the places. There's something about this. And where you can sense it, if you go to Israel with this, where you can sense this is at the Wailing Wall. Because the Wailing Wall is the retaining wall around this mountain right here. And so you're on this, you're on this mountain, but you're the retaining wall around it where the temple is built on top. 
And there's something about that. I remember the first time going there to Israel and walking up to the Wailing Wall. I didn't even want to touch it. It was like electricity in the air. There, God is in this place. Like never before, like I've never since before, God is here. There is, there, is sacred, there is sacred spaces. Now, does the Bible speak about that? Yes. And so let me say this to you. And I'll get, I want to come back. This would be a great sermon. Okay. Is this. You are sacred space. Did you know that? You are, the, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. You're sacred space, right? Oh, that sounds weird, Pastor. Good, that, good. I'm, thinking, I, I'm glad you think that way because this is pretty powerful stuff. All right, so I don't want to get sidetracked because I do want to do some history on this. Uh, but here, this event that I'm going to come back to probably next time, but this event right here, it takes place where, where he builds the altar. Here comes this, this destroying angel, and where he builds the altar and where it stopped is right here on this, on this threshing floor, this threshing floor, all right, which will become the temple. All right, this is the area also, you know, will become, this is Jebusite city, will become the city of David. It's up here on this area right here. This, will, this is also, go back in history, this is also the place where this took place. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and offer him on a hill. This is the same hill. This is the same. All the places it could be in Israel. It's here on Mount Moriah, the Bible tells us. In fact, let me show you that. It's worth it. It's worth taking a moment. Take a left in your Bible. Go to Genesis chapter 22. Let's take just a moment and look at this. I love this story. It's a powerful story because if we know, we know, I miss Paul Harvey. I miss those days. We know the rest of the story. How many remember Paul Harvey? Every wrinkled hand should be up, all right? Paul Harvey, he was an a, a icon. When news was really news and Walter Cronkite was alive and Paul Harvey, when news was really news and it was honorable to listen to the news, those guys were alive. Now it's a bunch of boop, boop, okay? All right, you get over there. I'm not going to get political. I should, but I won't. That's not going to help us tonight. After these things, God tested Abraham, verse 1, gotta love that, and said to him, Abraham, here I am. Don't take that for granted right there. Abraham, Moses, so many in the Bible, and listen, even with us, God will interact with us. This sounds like, what we just, we're so used to stories like this, and you know, so he's going along, Abraham, you know, oh, yeah, Lord. You know, God speaks to us through that still small voice. God will still direct us today. I love that. I love that about following God. Most of the time, because I'm kind of thick-headed, uh, some, most of the time it's after it's already happened. I go, wow, look what God was doing. Look how he spoke to me. Look how he directed me. But it's so, I love those Holy Ghost goosebump moments. You ever have those where you just know God is here. God's doing the work. He still loves us. He's still interacting with us. And here he says, now this is going to be heavy for Abraham. We know the rest of the story. We know what's going on. But we're going to see a man of faith right here. Abraham, here I am. He says, now listen to this wording. Some of you will catch this pretty fast. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. Okay. Take your son, your only son problem right there. That's not accurate, is it? In God's sight, it is. But what's the problem with that? He has Ishmael. He has another son. That's a work of the flesh. Remember that? Remember that whole moment with Sarah? You know, I can't have any children. Hey, won't you go have sex with my, with my servant? You know, you're okay with that? Okay. You know, you think about, think about these stories in the Bible. These people are knuckleheads, you know, and it's abusive. That's an abusive story, by the way. Abusive, that's an abusive couple, okay? I mean, you know, really just back up and look at these stories. Look who God loves. You know, these people are so screwed up, there's hope for us. Okay, these guys are really screwed up. Take your son, but God doesn't see the work of the flesh. Take your son, your only son. That's the one that I see. In fact, there's, there'll be times that, that, um, that he'll say, oh, that Ishmael will live before you. You know, don't forget my, that, he's my son too. God didn't forget him and, and there was a blessing on him, but that wasn't where the promise was. That wasn't what, what God's best for him. But he also says, take your son, your only son, whom you love, whom you love. 
Now, whenever you're trying to, to, to study something, you're going to study out the, the, the concept of love or worship or any of these things, one of the things that we do is you go back to the first time it's used. When is that word used, that concept used? And it'll kind of give you the, God loves to set the tone by giving you the first concept, the first time it's used, give you the concept, and it kind of sets the tone for that particular concept. And, and the word love, where do you think the first time the word love is used? Right here. Take your son, your only son, whom you love. First use, whom you love. It's the love of a father for a son that is, that, that's going to be sacrificed. Mm, think about that. Okay, your son, whom you love. Take him on this mountain, Mount Moriah. Okay, 50 miles. It's a 50-mile journey. It's going to take him three days as you're going to get there. Now, the Mount Moriah that's there is, is, one little, is, is a little mountain range that's there it's, uh, you have Mount Zion, the Mount of Olives, and then right here, today, this is where the temple stands, where the temple stood, today the Dome of the Rock and that kind of stuff. But here, take him on Mount Moriah. So he tells them, we don't have to guess where this took place. He tells them where to take him. So he, so he knows what direction to go. So he starts, he starts walking, and he's got, he's got a, a trek. But, but I want you to notice this too. Notice this about him. He says, offer him as a... Now, this, this sounds completely contrary. Offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. Now, I think I would go, what? I rebuke that. I know. Hold on now. I know. But here, burnt offering. Now, if he said do that with a neighbor kid, that's different. But he said do it with your own kid. Do it with your own kid, you know. You can maybe handle that one, but that's my child. That's who I love. That is the joy of my life. The thing is this, we would not know what he was thinking. And I'll show you this in a minute. And unless it was not told to us later on in the New Testament, I'll show you what he was thinking. I love this. But here he, he says, now, if you watch the movie, uh, the, I think it's called The Bible, where George C. Scott is playing Abraham, you'll see him shaking his fist before God going, no, don't do it, no, you know, and he's doing that. Or you see the Bible one, the recent one there, and then Sarah's running up doing, don't do it. That's all, that's, that was really inaccurate. Uh, the Bible one that was just done recently by the Touched by an Angel gal, that, that had just about every single story they told was inaccurate. You know, why tell a story if you're not going to tell it accurately? All right, so anyway, so, so, but notice what it says here. Let's read this. What happens, take your son, your only son, offer him on a hill that I show you, as a burnt offering. Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled the donkey, and took two of the young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering, and he rose and, and went to the place of which God had told him. Notice what happens here. Notice the wording here. It changes, it says this happened, then this happened, then this happened. In other words, he was just purposed in doing this. I'm going to trust in you, God, and he just starts moving out and doing it. And then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. He opened up his eyes and said, okay, there it is. That's the place. Okay. And Abraham said to the young man, stay here with the donkey. So he's got, he's got four of them are with him. He's got two young guys with him, and then he's got his, him and his son. Okay, and so stay here with the donkey and I and the boy will go over there and worship and, and come again to you. We're going to go over here. We're going we're gonna to worship God and, and come back. Abraham took the, the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. Think about how this is going down. Isaac, and he took, uh, he took in his hand the knife, the fire and the knife. So they, so they both went there together. Now, don't think it, you know, sometimes, sometimes these stories is going to be like a little kid and here he goes. That's not, that's not accurate. What, what is accurate is we know that Abraham is about 130 years old. He's an old guy. And his son, Isaac, is, is between 30 and 40 years old. All right, the chronology of this we know because we can track with the story. He's over 30 years old. You know, if you want to be technical and you got to study Bible, they try to pin it down to about 37. So he's not, so he's, he's, he's not a, he's not a kid, right? Okay. He could kick his dad's butt. All right. Think about that. He, here he goes. He's got the wood. He's going along. Okay. He's carrying the wood. The son is carrying the wood. Isaac's carrying the wood. Isaac said to his father, Hey dad, father, 
here, my son. He said, behold, got the fire, got the wood, so where's the lamb for the burnt offering? We forgot something, Dad. You know, hey, I like what we're doing up here, but hey, we forgot the lamb. I like what he says. Abraham said, God will provide. The word for is added by the translators to screw this up. It's not for. God will provide himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Okay, but a couple things here. One of them, so what's going on in his mind? Okay, so he's going to do this. He's going he's to follow the instructions that God gave him. Now, again, we'd go, okay, uh, that's lots of faith. That's trusting in God. I, I get that. But when we get to Hebrews, it's mentioned here. Hebrews says this. It says, And Abraham, when he was tested, offered, offering up Isaac, and he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son. He was in the act. In other words, when we see this, and you know what's going to happen, as he's got that knife, he's going to be going, he, he's, he's after it. He's going he's to do exactly what God told him to do, and he's, you know, stop that. And grab, you know, almost like some of the pictures I have, you know, kind of grab it as I am. Don't, don't, don't do this. While he was in the process of doing this, he says, offering up his son Isaac, of whom, though Isaac shall, shall your offspring be named, he considered that God was able even to rise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac, and then it goes on there. So what is it? what was just said there? It says here that Abraham understood, God, you gave me a promise. The promise was that I will be blessed and the generations will be blessed through this son, not Ishmael, through this son. So if you're doing something, maybe you're going to, in, in the book of Hebrews, maybe you're going to even raise him from the dead. I don't know how you're going to play this out. I just know you made a promise, and in that promise, it's going to be through Isaac that the world's going to be blessed. It's going to be through Isaac there's going to be descendants. The descendants so much like the, like the stars in the heaven or the sand on the seashore. That's how many descendants are going to be through this kid. So if you want me to go up there and sacrifice him and burn him, then that's going to make you look bad. All right, you can kind of see this going back because you made a promise. Right. And if God makes a promise, you know what? He's going to keep that promise. Maybe not the way you think he's going to keep it, but God will keep that promise. I like that that's in there. It helps me, it, it helps me relax a little bit with Abraham, you know, because this, think about if you're a parent, think about how that would be. You know, take your son, take your daughter, and I want you to take him up on a hill. I want you to kill them, and I want you to burn their bodies. You know, now, again, I understand it's a different culture. I understand some of that, the Canaanite religions was doing that very thing. God had told them not to do that. And yet this was, a, this was some way of just everyone seeing, look at the faith of this man. I want you to have faith like him, to trust me even when it doesn't make sense. Lord, help us have faith when it doesn't make Sometimes it doesn't make sense. I want you to sell your house. I want you to quit your job. I know you've, 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 you've planted a couple churches and they're doing very well and I want you to move to Utah, all right? And I said, what? What? I'm not moving to Utah. I still remember sitting on the couch in Sacramento and, and me and Allison was crying going, God, you're ruining our lives. What are you sending us to Salt Lake City for? What are you doing that for? You know, we got here and it's, you know, you heard, you heard me talk about this in the past, but but I, you know, coming over here, I just thought that maybe she messed up so bad, he's punishing us and sending us here. And if you've been here for 30 years, I've been here for over 30 years in, in Salt Lake City, if you've been here 30 years, you know it was a different world 30 years ago. All right, it's a different world. It's a different world today. I can talk about Jesus and the love of Jesus, and I made all kinds of people love Jesus and know Jesus. Before that, we were, we were people from like the invasion of the body snatchers. You know, you just felt like when you're in a grocery store, everybody's looking at you go, oh, there's one. You know, you ever see that movie? Okay, that's what it felt like being here 30 years ago. All right, so, so following God, Lord help us in this, following God when it doesn't make sense. Make sure it's God. Make sure it's not the, some, some weird little thing that you want to do and you're manipulating the situation through saying God's doing it. But if God is telling you to do something, you know the best thing to do? Just do it. Yeah. Do it. Best thing to do. If God's showing you to do something, do it. This is one of those things It's like, I don't know... I, I'm glad I'm not in this story because I don't know that I could do this. I don't, think, I don't think I have that much faith. Could you do that? Could you, could you take someone that you love and do, do this? 
you know, Lord help us. I don't know that I could do this. This would be really tough, you know. Father, where's a, where's a, I love how it's said here. Abraham says, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering. Something's being set up. Remember where it's at. Remember what's going to be. Moriah, by the way, is not just, not just the top of that hill or the, or the, the, the floor that was there, you know, there, there's, it's, it's a little bit bigger. There's other structures. There's other events that took place on that same hill. Just, okay, the top of it, there's another event. So the, so the top of the hill and right on the kind of, on the bottom side of that hill, another event took place. All right, stay tuned. That's, that's going to be really important. All right, so they came to the place where God had told them. Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order, bound Isaac, his son, laid him on the altar on top of the wood, and Isaac reached out his hand. Now remember, they're both willing in this. Isaac is just as willing as his dad because his dad's 130 years old, about 130 years old. He's in his 30s. He can take his dad out. You know, at least he could stop dad. You have gone completely insane. What are you doing? That's not what he's doing. There's trust on both levels right here. So he says this, the angel of the Lord shows up. I love the angel of the Lord. Whenever you see the angel of the Lord, kind of keep an eye on that. Who is that? I love the word of promise. Uh, Jim Caviezel, is it Jim? Not Jim Caviezel. Is that right? The guy played Jesus, right? Jim Caviezel. Play Jesus. And so in that, in the word of promise, he's the voice of Jesus in the New Testament. When they play this out, he's the voice here. They got something right here. Did Jesus show up for this moment? Maybe. Maybe. An angel of the Lord. Always look at when it says angel of the Lord. Look at the context of this. Okay. And if you're not familiar with that, stay tuned. When we go through the Old Testament, we hit stuff like that. Angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, here am I. Do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything for him. Uh, for now I know that you fear God, seeking that you not withheld your son, your, own, your only son, from me. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a, was a ram caught in the thicket of, uh, uh, by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. As it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. That's important right there. On that mountain, on that mountain, take the mountain. You go to the mountain that I tell you. It took him 50 miles and three days walk to finally get to that particular mountain right there. There's a threshing floor on the top. It would become that for David. But there's something else going on here. The angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time and says, by myself, I have sworn to cleanse the Lord because you have done this. And have not withheld your son, your only son, I surely will bless you. Surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and the sands that are on the seashore. Your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offering shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned. Look at verse 19. Abraham returned to the young men, and they arose. There's something missing right here. Abraham returned to the young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived in Beersheba. Okay, now we're going to assume that, and we, it's a good assumption, that, that Isaac was with him. It doesn't say Isaac was with him. Check this out. You don't see Isaac again until it's time in the chapters coming up, is in the time to go get his bride. What is going on here? What is God doing? What is God doing? Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and offer him on the hill that I show you. On that same hill Right on that same hill is, is going to be where Jesus is going to be crucified on Moriah. The top of the hill is the Temple Mount area. And you get a go, go look at any kind of, uh, you look from the, from the Mount of Olives, okay, and there's tons of pictures on the internet you can see. And you'll see the Temple Mount, you'll see the Dome of the Rock, okay, a lost a mosque there. And so, and so you're standing on the Mount of Olives, you see that, just look straight ahead and you'll see a church with a, with a cross on it that's just right there. That's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. That's the, that's the church uh, that, that where the crucifixion took place. Didn't happen in the garden tomb. That's another story for another time. Come to our, our Israel tour information that we do here. But, uh, but that's where it happened, on that same hill. On that same hill. So what was he doing? He was loading up his son with that wood. He carried, he carried the cross. 
He carried the wood. He was that sacrifice, you know. I mean, it's so, when you start thinking about this, you meditate on this and think about every, the little nuances of this story and what happened with Jesus. God was setting up a, a story here. On that hill, and he said, even as, as he even proclaimed the name, this, on this hill, it's going to be provided. On that hill, it was provided for us. It was on that hill that Jesus died upon that cross. You know, Lord, help us in this. Help us to understand this, how powerful this is, how powerful this is. In its sacred spaces. Take your son, your only son. Well, sacred spaces, all right? So this, that mountain would later, and we don't have to guess about this. God is real clear. It's the same mountain, same hill that, that, that Solomon's going to build the temple, that it's a ruinous threshing floor. And on that, let's, let me just get you used to this, and then we'll, we'll do some of this next time, is in Exodus 25 now. Exodus 25, we got the geography, we know what's going to happen, now what's going to be up there is another major uh, part of who we are as a child of God. There's so many parts of this tabernacle, temple, you're the temple of God. There's so many of it, that there's so many aha moments in this. And we're not going to be able to do them all right now, but I at least want you to get familiar with this. It says this, Exodus 25, and the Lord said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel and, and, and take me a contribution. Every man whose heart, now listen to this. Every man whose heart moves him, he shall receive the contribution for me. I want you to take an offering, okay? They're on, they're, they're, he's coming down from the mountain. Now, when he received the Ten, the, the, the Ten Commandments and all that, Charlton Eston up on that mountain receiving the Ten Commandments and all that, uh, when that happened, they were camped out around that bottom of that hill for about a year. All right, so don't see them just, they're kind of just in passing. They're, no, they were there for about a year. And when he came down from the mountain, it wasn't just with the Ten Commandments. He had the, the, all the plans for what we're going to see here. He had uh, laws that they were going to keep. There was a lot. I love that uh, one of the, I saw one of the pictures, and I should, I should try to find this. It was actually uh, Freeberg that did it, uh, that had, had Moses coming down from the mountain with the, with the Ten Commandments and some engineering scrolls. And I go, that's kind of cool right there. I don't know if it went down that way. I think it was in his head and his heart that God had given it to him. But I thought that was cool. He understood. He didn't come back just with the Ten Commandments. He came back with, with the tablets of stone and all that. He came back with this. With this is so specific. And God is saying, look, we're going to build a... We're going to build a tabernacle here, and you call everybody to give. Every man whose heart is moved, you know, okay, the Bible talks about you give as God puts it on your heart. Okay? And this is the contributions. This is what we need to build this thing. We need gold, we need silver, we need bronze. We need blue and purple okay, and scarlet yarn. Super rare stuff right there in that this time. Fine, fine twined Linen, goat's hair, tanned, uh, ram skin, goat skin, acacia wood, oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil and the fragrant incense, onyx stones and stones for settings for the ephod, for the breastplate, and, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. Exactly as I show you concerning the patterns of the tabernacle and all its furnishings, so you shall make it. Again, in fact, I want to start with this next time, is, this, is that sacred space. This is, this is so important. I want you to make this exactly the way I tell you. And he gives them very specific. It's so specific that you can today reconstruct this completely right down to the, to the, for the inches of how this thing is, is looking and how it's supposed to be. You can reconstruct this. And there, every once in a while, there's one, I think the Seventh-day Adventists have one that they travel around with. There's two of them in Israel. And sometimes we'll go there and see the ones in Israel. But this tabernacle that he's going to have them built. Right? So I'm not going to go through this. We're going to run out of time. But um, the Holy of Holies, this, this, this building that's here, you have this, uh, let me go back here. You have this tent structure, and you should be familiar with this because this is exactly how, and I'll, I'll go back over this when we go over the temple because this is, this is actually the, the, what will become. This will become the tabernacle and then later the temple, all right? Okay, so you have, 
you have here the structure, you have the holy place, and you have the holy of holies, right, with the Ark of the Covenant in there. And so, and, and we'll get to that. We're, we, we still need to build, spend time on Solomon's temple, because that's what's still ahead of us, and to see how he built it and all this. And we'll be coming back to this here. Ark of the Covenant. Here's one thing you do know, right? Don't open that lid, all right? Your face will melt right off your skull. I saw, I saw it happen on Indiana Jones. Did you see that? Okay. Don't let, that did get him in trouble, though, didn't it? That's not just a fairy tale, not just Hollywood. That actually have the Philistines looked in it, and what did, what did they get? Do you remember this? They got hemorrhoids real bad. Go look it up. And, you know, we taught that they got hemorrhoids. All right, that's, I'd rather have my face slide, slide off than to get, get hemorrhoids. That's, you know, okay. If you don't believe me, go look. Okay, so uh, actually I taught on this, wasn't very long ago, on, on that whole when they lost the Ark of the Covenant and the Philistines had it and all that. All right. But there is a place, there is a place in Israel all the way down by a lot uh, that they do have the tabernacle set up exactly as it would be. And it's really cool if you get a chance to see this one. There's one in, there's a half one that, that helps. They don't have the whole courtyard, but they have the main tent and all that set up in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania. There's one there at the, um, I forgot now who's got that, but they, they have, we've seen that one. So it's actually good to, to kind of get a feel for how that is, you know. But um, here in this section, and, and uh, you can go online because we've taught through this, is that it has, this is the Ark of the Covenant. This is what you're to build. This is the, the table of showbread that you're to build, exactly how you're to build it. This is the tabernacle, the instruction on, on the size and all the tabernacle. This is what you're to build. Why is it important to hit this here? Because this is what, this, there is the geography, which is the, the threshing floor of Aruna. Okay, they will become the temple, and there, there's what is on top of it. Both of them are important. Both of them have huge you know, things about us as, as a child of God because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I do want to talk about that because that's such a fun topic, but it'll lead, us, it'll lead up to too much time. So, so again, we started here in 1 Chronicles 21, the threshing floor, right, that would become, that would become the temple. This is the... This we become the city of David, right? David's, David's uh, little palace right here. We know that from archaeology today. And then you have this, this um, you know, flat area where you have the temple. And this is where we're going to pick it up next time, the preparation for Solomon's temple. Because David wants to build this. He's starting to get the idea, okay, God, we, we really need to get a temple, a place for us to meet with you. I'm not talking about now, you got to, we live in Utah. You got to get completely out of your head anything that, when you say temple, anything in Utah is far removed from the biblical temples. Otherwise, where's the sacrifice? Where's the, where's the place where the animals are at or any of this stuff? And so you have to get that out of your head. I'm not trying to be offensive, but what we have here as temples is nothing, has no representation at all, zero of a biblical temple. And there was only one. All right, the one that was there, the, the one, there was another one in Israel, but it was one by, by the Samaritans, and it was not a temple. It was a, and that's a lot, another big story. It was not a temple that, that, that God ordained at all. It was actually a, a, a reason for them, is a way for them to fight against the nation of Israel, right? Another thing, but one temple, all right? And so, all right, that's a lot tonight, huh? I hope, I hope some of this take away. It is a lot tonight. It's more than we normally do. But the reality of it is this. I wanted you to see that, that God has a plan for each one of us. And I want you to, and I really want to, I will, I will start with this next time, is that I want you to see how important you, how, how important you are. You are a child of God. You're a child of God. You are, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? You need to understand who you are. It should cause us, when I think about this today, I was really meditating on this today. I really think it makes me want to do more about living for him in all that I do. Because we are sacred space. 
Lord, help us in this. I will show you from the scriptures where that's true. I'll show you the next time from the scriptures. Be ready. Let's do a Bible study on that. Because so I think that's important enough to pause for a minute. Before we continue on, and we'll go through uh, looking at uh, David trying to build the temple. Uh, he won't be able to, but his son. And then we still there's still a lot to cover. And so good stuff. All right, perfect timing. We're done. You know what happens. I'm going to pray. You get this, right? Are you visiting here? Is this your first time here? Well, this is where the pastor gets rude and runs you off. All right, so. <laughs> Father, we really, really love you. Lord, we ramble through this way too fast, Lord, and there's some super deep nuggets of truth, Lord, that we pass by. But Father, I pray that, Lord, that we would hear your voice tonight, Lord, to understand that you love us, that you're faithful. Lord, in all these stories of the Bible, Lord, of these things that happened in the past, Lord, it just shows your faithfulness over and over again. But Lord, help us to live for you. Help us to live a life that honors you. And we'll trust in you. We love you, Jesus. Give us a hunger for your word. Give us understanding in the things that we're reading. We trust in you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. amen. All right.